Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so being able to accurately track the goals of others uh, plays a very important role in our everyday lives. It enables us to um, accurately predict the actions of other people as well as to coordinate and perform joint actions with others. So it's therefore unsurprising that much research has focused on the emergence of goal tracking in early childhood. And we know that even from the first year of life, goal tracking is fairly sophisticated insofar as it is sensitive to um, external constraints faced by other agents, as well as internal states such as uh, beliefs and preferences. Now, in much of this research, um, the experimental scenarios involve the target agent's goal um, not changing over the course of a single test trial or over the course of a single set of goal-directed actions. But of course, sometimes our goals do change and our goals can change while we are performing goal-directed actions. So in order to accurately represent the goals of other agents, it's not enough that we simply ascribe a goal to another agent, but rather we need to continue to update our representations of others' goals um, over time and in light of new information that might ind indicate that the agent's goals have changed. Um, and we know fairly little about whether children uh, are able to do this uh, in spite of its importance for social cognition um, and pro-social behaviours. So I've already mentioned um, action prediction and coordination, but I think that this is um, particularly important for a kind of mature and flexible approach to instrumental helping. So just to illustrate that point, suppose that I have the goal to get a cup of coffee. Um, so I stand up from my desk, I grab my jacket, I walk towards the door, and then I stop. So on the one hand, I might have stopped because that goal has been interrupted by an unexpected obstacle. For instance, I might realize that I actually have a meeting right now, so I don't have time to get that coffee immediately. So I still want to get that coffee, but I have to stop and come up with a new plan with regards to how I'm going to get it. So in this case, um, you should not update your representation, or sorry, you shouldn't change your representations of my goals because I still want that coffee. And if you were to help me by buying me a cup of coffee, I would be very appreciative of that. On the other hand, I might have halted my goal-directed actions because my goals have changed, because I have abandoned the goal to get coffee. For instance, if I realise that it's too late in the day for me to have coffee anyway. Um, so in this case, you, you should update your representations of my goals to reflect the fact that I no longer want that coffee. And you certainly shouldn't try to help me by buying me a cup of coffee that I, I no longer want anyway. Um, so in order to um, accurately represent... Oh, sorry. So in order to understand when it is, and importantly, when it is no longer appropriate to help other agents achieve their goals, um, it's important to continue to update your representations of others' goals over time. And in particular, it's important that you can distinguish between goal-directed actions that were halted because the goal was abandoned and because the goal was interrupted. Um, so our question is simply, can children differentiate between these different um, reasons for which an agent might halt a goal-directed action? Um, so more generally, there seems to be a little research that focuses on children's understanding of abandoned goals. But fortunately, there is quite a lot of research which seems to show that children understand when a goal-directed action is halted because the agent has encountered an obstacle. I have in mind this research on instrumental helping that we've had a couple of talks uh, referring to so far. Um, so it's been fairly well, uh, widely replicated that uh, children will instrumentally help an agent um, achieve their goal if the agent encounters an obstacle. So for instance, if an experimenter, um, if there's an object out of reach, an experimenter is reaching for it, it's clear that they want to get that object, and children will hand the object to the experimenter. So using this research as a starting point, we designed an instrumental helping task to investigate whether children differentiate between goal-directed actions that have been halted because the goal was interrupted and because the goal was abandoned, um, and focusing on uh, 24 to 30 month olds. So this is the uh, basic setup we have here. There's an experimenter in between two different boxes. 
Um, the basic task is just sorting small cubes, which you'll see more clearly in a second in my hand, sorting small cubes into these two different uh, boxes. We have two conditions. They both start with the experimenter uh, initiating and then halting a goal-directed action. But in one condition, um, it's because the experimenter encounters an obstacle. In the other condition, it's because the experimenter changes their mind about where he wants the toy to go. And in both cases, he then asks for uh, help. So hopefully the sound... Oh. Sorry, is okay? Look, where would I put it? In the yellow box? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. No, I want this in the green box. So I'm establishing a goal-directed action. I'm initiating it. Look, and I've encountered an obstacle. I can no longer reach my desired box. So in this case, the correct location is the green box, and Lawrence is very clever. He's identified that, and he's helped appropriately. In this condition, I'm going to abandon my goal. No, I want this in the green box. One, two... So changing my mind about where I want the toy to go. Now I want this in the yellow box. I do not want this in the green box anymore. Mm -mm. You can walk anywhere. Can you help me put it where I want it? Of course, the correct location here is the yellow box. And you'll all be glad to know I was teased mercilessly by my, by my family when I showed them this video. <laughs> um, so this is a pre-registered study, so our methods, analyses, and importantly our stopping point for data collection are all uh, pre-registered. We're currently 21 out of 24 children through data collection. As you can see, this is a within-subject design, and we have four test trials per condition, with alternating conditions. Um, and we're counterbalancing three factors. The first is the first box that the experimenter is interested in. The second is the order in which children experience the conditions, in case there are biased learning effects. Um, and finally, we are counterbalancing the last box that the experimenter refers to, um, and specifically where, whether this is the correct um, helping location. Um, and we're doing this just in case children are simply placing the toy wherever the experimenter last uh, refers to. Um, so we have three questions. Um, the first question is one that I've already mentioned before, and it's our main question. Do children differentiate between these two conditions? Um, in their helping, helping behaviour. Um, the measure that we have here is the is initial location placement. So on each trial, do children place it in the box that the experimenter is initially interested in? So do they place it in the box that the experimenter wants the toy to go at the beginning of the test trial? Or do they place it in the alternative box? So that's our first question and first measure. Our second question, do children find either condition easier? So is helping accuracy higher in one condition compared to the other? Our measure here is um, correct helping. So in each trial, do children place the toy um, where the experimenter wants it to go by the end of the trial, so by the time the experimenter asks for help? Um, second question, second measure. Our third question is, is performance above chance, is helping accuracy above chance um, in each condition? And again, uh, the measure here is helping accuracy, or correct helping. Okay, so onto our results so far. On the y-axis, we can see the percentage of trials on which we observe a given behavior. On the x-axis, we have our two conditions, interrupted on the left, abandoned on the right. What we're looking at at the moment is our first measure, so the initial location placement. And what we can see is that in 57% of the interrupted uh, trials, um, on 57% of those trials, children are placing the toy in the location that the experimenter was interested in at the beginning of the trial, the initial location. 
Um, and that falls, so that's 57% for the interrupted condition. That falls to 34% for the abandoned condition. So our first and main question was, do children differentiate between these two conditions? So are these numbers um, different? Um, and we found that children do indeed differentiate between these conditions. So using generalized linear mixed models, we found that the odds of children placing the toy in the initial location were 70% lower for the abandoned condition as compared to the interrupted condition. So children do differentiate in their helping, helping behavior between these conditions. Um, On to our second measure, that was helping accuracy. Um, so are children placing the toy in the location that the experimenter wants it to go by the end of the trial? Um, for the interrupted condition, children are helping accurately in 57% of trials. For the abandoned condition, this is 66% of trials that they are helping accurately. Um, so our second question was, do children find either condition easier? So are, are these numbers different? Um, and we found that children are not performing better in either condition. But interestingly, um, when we compared performance to chance, we found that children were only performing above chance in the abandoned goal condition and not in the interrupted goal condition. So this is a, it's a bit surprising um, that they're not performing above chance in the interrupted goal condition for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is simply uh, you know, appealing to this research that I mentioned earlier that, um, on instrumental helping. That research has been widely replicated and seems to show that children understand when um, an agent's actions are um, merely interrupted by an obstacle, but the agent still has the goal. Um, so for that reason, it's a bit surprising that they're not performing above chance in the interrupted goal condition. Um, it's also a bit surprising because just intuitively, in the interrupted goal condition, um, I would have thought that it's a bit easier to understand what's going on because you can sort of, there's a visible reason for the experimenter's behavior. The tubes move and the experimenter can no longer reach uh, the desired uh, tube. Um, so it's a bit surprising that they were only performing above chance in the abandoned goal condition. Um, so I've got a a couple of possible reasons here um, for why they might be struggling with the interrupted condition. Um, one is that they might be using um, emotions as a heuristic for goal tracking. So in the interrupted goal condition, the experimenter is straining towards um, you know, their, their uh, target, towards the, the box that they do want the toy to go in. Um, and children might view that as a negative emotion. So if they're using um, emotions as a heuristic for goal tracking, then they would see that I'm exhibiting a negative emotion towards that box, so they might conclude that I don't want the toy to go there after all. Um, another possibility is that children might be thinking that because I have encountered an obstacle, um, I therefore have, or I therefore will, abandon my goal. Um, and I make this suggestion because this is something that does happen in everyday life. Sometimes we'll start a task and then we'll encounter an unexpected obstacle or an obstacle that was larger than we initially thought. Um, and on the basis of that, we'll decide not to bother. We'll change our minds. Um, so I've listed these as possible reasons. I'm not entirely convinced by either of them because they, they both require that children are ignoring some of the other signals being given off by the experimenter, such as the fact that I am still reaching, I'm still sort of trying to put the toy in that box. Um, it would also require that they're ignoring um, what I'm saying, for instance. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested in hearing um, other, other thoughts about uh, what's, what might be going on in that condition. Um, so just to conclude, um, I think there are two main takeaways from this study. The first is that um, two-year-olds do indeed seem to um, update their representations of others' goals um, over time and during the course of a goal-directed action. Um, and that they can use, they use this to um, guide their helping behavior. Um, although they do find this fairly difficult. And more specifically, children do seem to differentiate between goal-directed actions that were halted because the goal was interrupted and because the goal was just abandoned. The other main takeaway is that um, two-year-olds, I think for the first time, this is evidence that two-year-olds do understand 
um, what's happening when an agent halts a goal-directed action because they just change their mind, because they abandon um, the goal. So we can see that um, uh, for two-year-olds, um, two-year-olds already have these quite key building blocks for kind of um, mature and flexible online goal tracking and uh, pro-social behaviour. Um, so I'd just like to finish by thanking my co-authors, Barbora Sipasova, Sotaro Kita, John Michael, my colleagues at the Sense of Commitment Lab in Warwick, and the ERC for funding this project, and the organisers for putting on the conference. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you for the talk. We have five minutes for questions. Hi, thank you. I'm here. Hi. <coughs> Sorry. So I was wondering about the fact that in this paradigm, it seems to me that neither of the boxes is more of a rational choice than the other. So it doesn't matter if you want it in the yellow box or the green box, because there is no outcome which is better than the other. So I was wondering, how do we know that they actually not just ignoring your request and actually doing executing their own goals? So I think that that's a possibility mm -hmm. because it's not, why, why would they want that? Or, okay, you want that, but maybe they have a goal of their own. Um, yes, so in the, um, um, so, so this is quite an important point, so we uh, deliberately designed this um, so that neither sort of task was more um, fun or interesting, um, and part of the reason was that was so that there'd be a focus just on the experimenter's um, goals, um, so that it's, it's just about where the experimenter um, wants the toy to go. Um, so some of the children... Uh, I get the impression they really are just doing their own thing and they're not really paying attention to the experimenter. Um, but this is part of the reason that we're counterbalancing all of these different factors. Um, so if, if you believe that children are just kind of doing their own thing and they don't differentiate between the two, then they should be at chance in both conditions. And this is part of the reason we did that third um, test to uh, compare performance in each condition to chance. Um, so that, you know, it might be the case that for the interrupted condition, they aren't paying attention to the experimenter's goals, um, but I, um, I don't know if that's um, if we can convincingly say that of the abandoned goal condition because they um, they are placing it where the experimenter wants to put it um, above uh, chance. Um, yeah, does that does that answer your your question? Yeah. Sorry. Yes, so in the, in the original paradigms where you need to predict what the other person is going to do is a bit different from doing it yourself. So maybe they would do much better if they were encouraged with a reward or whatever, that if you do exactly as the experimenter asks, um, then you will get mm -hmm. a sticker and then you could eliminate my concern. But yeah, no, that but yes. I, I guess that is, that is um, definitely true. I hadn't thought about... Um, I mean, I guess the only kind of reward that I give, um, is that, you know, I kind of encourage them, I, I clap, but I, I do that um, whatever they, wherever they put it. Um, but yeah, that's an idea worth keeping in mind moving forward. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, yeah. Hello. Sorry, right next. <laughs> uh, thank you for a very, very interesting talk and very interesting uh, video. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, but I'd like to contest maybe the, your first conclusion. So my impression, if I followed well uh, the, the video, is that you're telling them at the end uh, what to do, right? At the end of the, uh, uh, there are a lot of things happening, and at the end you say, can you help me to place uh, this? And uh, in the end, it seems that in both conditions, what children are doing is uh, following your instruction, that is to place the, the cube where you've told them you want it to be placed. So is there really a difference between these two, between the behavior of children in these two conditions? Um, so, I th um, so I think in order for them to um, place it where I, where I want it to go, they need to be tracking my goals, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, they just need to understand the sorry. last sentence you, you told them, I think. The last two sentences, maybe. Right. Um, ah, okay. Um, so it, it does. Um, it, of course, it does require that they understand the last few sentences. Um, but then there's also um, 
for the abandoned goal, there's a tension because earlier on, I was saying that I want it in this one, and then I want it in this box. Um, there isn't that tension in the interrupted condition. Um, but I would, I would be surprised if they are only paying attention to the final two sentences. So, for instance, if I only said the first few sentences where I say, you know, I want it in this box, can you help me? Um, I suspect they would probably be able to, they would probably put it where I want it. So I, I think they're probably paying attention to um, the first few sentences as well as the, the last few sentences. Uh, does that kind of make sense? Um, Maybe I think, I think it would be worse uh, having that kind of control, probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, last quick question. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about quick. But, uh, <laughs> um, well, so you speaking? You, uh, here, here, sorry. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Uh, so you, you, uh, you ask for some suggestions uh, about the, the um, well, possible interpretations of the interrupted uh, uh, action. Yeah. Uh, so the, I mean, just one possibility is that, that children would just clearly uh, think that this action is still within your your capabilities, right? I mean, you can just get up and and do the thing. I don't know how you behave be between the trials in this setup, and but in and in the in the broader sort of perspective. So the the what obviously um, um, gets our reaction when watching uh, those movies is that uh, you behave in a very exaggerated way and so on. So I'm I'm curious to know if you think. So what, uh, do you think um, children in this situation can uh, basically detect that they're observing actions that are performed uh, in a manner which is you know, very different from a typical instrumental actions that they typically observe? Or, and and should, it, should it matter or, or not? Do you think this is just, they should treat them as just regular instrumental actions, but sort of, um, even easier to understand because they are performed this way, or um, uh, maybe there's a possibility that your behavior actually, you know, uh, cues Gets them away. towards a, mm -hmm. a different level of understanding, namely that you are communicating. Um, um, yeah. So, um, just to answer so your your first point about um, the fact that children might think that I'm still able to complete the action myself. Um, I think there's there's two points to keep in mind. The first is that. That is even more true for the abandoned goal where I ask them for help and they seem to be able to help accurately. Um, so if, I don't know if that would be able to explain the, inter the, the results for the interrupted condition. Um, and the other point on, on, on that same point is just that um, if you look at other instrumental helping studies, um, there are some in which the target agent really can't Maybe they don't have enough knowledge, they're not able to bring about the goal themselves. But in lots of the instrumental helping tasks, you know, it's an adult, they are able to, or they would be able to, whatever, grasp the object or um, open the door or something like this. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, it's possibility, but then it's kind of intention with these other instrumental helping tasks where it's also true that the adult could complete the task themselves, but children still seem to, um, to help appropriately. Um, so that was the first point. Um, the other point about, um, yeah, so the exaggeration. So, um, you know, you're right that it's kind of a bit awkward, the amount that I'm exaggerating. And, you know, we've got this kind of trade-off between um, ensuring that they understand what's going on and that I'm speaking slowly enough so they can follow um, and, yeah, not wanting to exaggerate too much so that my behaviour just seems entirely bizarre. Um, I mean, it is entirely bizarre, but... Um, but uh, yeah, so again, I would say that I'm exaggerating like that in both conditions. So I don't know if um, that would be able to explain why they're only above chance in one condition and not the other. Um, and again, I guess I would also say that you know that kind of exaggeration, maybe not always to this degree, but there is often exaggeration in these in instrumental helping tasks. So I don't know if um, you know if you've watched some of the the original uh, Felix Varnikin videos, you know, where he's kind of bumping into the cabinet and goes, oh. And you know, um, trying to reach an object that he clearly can reach, but you know he's kind of his hands falling short. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, the exaggeration is um, yeah, still an issue to, to keep in mind. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.